All right, well, let's go and get started. So good to see y'all. Hope you've had a great week. Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump into our Bible study for tonight. Uh, if you remember, I know it's been a few weeks with revival, and, and I was out of town. I appreciate Joe filling in for me when I was up, we were up in Virginia, and then missions night, so we're back at it on Wednesday night. So uh, we've been studying about our identity in Christ and how that, what that means for us, but also how that affects how we live, because so many Christians forget who they are in Christ. And we forget all that does to change us and also what it does to benefit us if you think about it that way as well. And so we're learning and going through that and we're continuing that thought tonight. So take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 3 is where we are tonight, Philippians chapter 3. And so uh, as you're turning there, I just want to begin with a verse from Psalms uh, just to kind of get our minds focused on our great God that we've come to worship tonight. Psalms 34, 19 says this, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Has anybody here ever been through afflictions? Maybe you're going through them right now. All of y'all should raise your hand. We've all been through afflictions, haven't we? But the verse doesn't stop there. It says this, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. I'm so thankful that's not some, but he says, the psalmist says, God's going to deliver us out of the afflictions we face in this life. He's going to deliver us out of all of them. Now, we realize some of that deliverance may not come until we leave this world and we're with Jesus forever in glory, you know, but God promises you're not going to be in this affliction forever. There's an end to it eventually, and I'm just thankful that some of the stuff that we go through, you've been through stuff, I've been through stuff, we've all been through different hard times, our afflictions, some of y'all going through it now, this is not going to consume you. This is not the end of it, but God will see you through this. That's the God we've come to worship tonight. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful and thankful simply because of who you are, an awesome God who loves us so much. And Father, we thank you that you know everything about us, and yet you still love us. And as I was listening to a message today on a podcast, Father, just reminded of your sovereignty, Father, that even in the darkest of pits of our lives, Father, you are still on the throne. You are still sovereign. And as the psalmist says here in Psalms 34, 19, that we will go through afflictions, but Lord, you promise to deliver us from them all. Not just half, not just 75%, not just 99%, but all of them, Lord. And we realize that some of that deliverance may not come until we leave this world and we're with you forever in heaven. But we thank you that these afflictions aren't going to consume us. They're just temporary. They're not eternal. And you promise, and you keep your word. We thank you for that, that you will bring deliverance to our life, and we give you praise. So as we study your word tonight, Father, once again, remind us of who we are in Christ and that affects how we live our life. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Philippians chapter 3 is where we are tonight. We're going to be looking at verses 13 and 14 um, as we get into the the study tonight. You know, back when I was getting married, uh, my best friend at the time, he's in heaven now, his name was Randy. And uh, he wanted to throw me a party. And, uh, you know, we're both Christian guys. We didn't want the traditional bachelor party. You know, I had no interest in that. He had no interest in that. So he decided to throw me a, a tool party. And I thought, hey, that's great. You know, the idea was going to have a cookout, and uh, all my friends would come, and they would bring me tools as gifts, and I could kind of build up my stock of tools and everything, because starting out, I didn't have much and everything, and so um, that was the idea. Well, there's this one guy that came. He's he's several years older than me, but he's a friend of mine, and, 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 and he just had a different sense of humor. You ever had somebody like that, that just, he's funny to himself, but nobody else? You know, that's kind of like this guy was. For example, for our wedding gift. He took a, one of these paper boxes, you know, that you get from like tailors that the paper comes in and wrapped it all up and inside was canned goods. You thought, well, that's nice. He gave you a bunch of canned goods. No. He took all the labels off the canned goods and had the stack of labels there and all the cans. But here was the kicker. In the midst of that cans and in the midst of those labels was dog food. So you don't know which can you're going to be opening up. That was his sense of humor. And he did that for everybody who got married, you know. And so for the gift for my tool party... He put a lot of effort into it. He went to, I don't know where he got it from, but he went and he bought a bowling ball. And then he bought about three feet of chain. And he filled up two of those holes, and then somehow, see, Jamie knows where I'm going with this. <laughs> don't you look next to her while I get going with this. You're in trouble. But he stuck the chain somehow. He connected that third hole and filled it in, and so you had a what? Exactly. Men, don't you look at your wives, because I don't have time for all this marital counseling this week. You know? Uh, and, and that was his gift to me. I'm thinking, where's my tool 
You know, I mean, this is not funny to me. Needless to say, that ball and chain didn't stay around my house very long. So, uh, and, and I have, let me be clear, I have never referred to Laura as my ball and chain. And, and, but that's the sad reality is a lot, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of men refer to their wives as the old ball and chain, you know. And, and it's like, you know, they get married and they, the idea is they lose their freedom, you know. But the sad reality of that thought is that a lot of Christians live their lives that way. Not in the idea of marriage, like my illustration, but the idea of being shackled to our past. Have you ever met somebody, and maybe this is you, whether you're here tonight or whether you're watching online, that your past controls you? The things that you have done in the past seem to have a hold on you. The things that you have done in the past put such guilt in your life that it's like you're paralyzed in your walk with God. Too many Christians feel enslaved to their past. They have no freedom from their past mistakes. They have no freedom from their failures, from their hurts, from their past sins. But here's the good news. Part of our identity in Christ, when Jesus Christ saved us and forgave us our sins, he gave us freedom from our past. And too many Christians forget that. Look at what Paul writes here in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, notice what he says, forgetting those things which are behind And reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Here in these two passages, these two verses, Paul is talking about something in the past, and he's talking about something in the future. Now, you think about the past, he speaks of forgetting those things that are behind. You know, at times, the past can be a a friend of ours, can't it? It can help us remember, you know, good things in our life, good times, especially you think about the day that we trusted Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. That's something we should never forget. That's something we should never get over. But the past can also be a terrible enemy. Listen to what pastor and teacher John MacArthur writes about verse 13 here. He writes this, Churches are full of spiritual cripples, paralyzed by the grudges, bitterness, sins, and tragedies of the past. Others try to survive in the present by reliving past successes. They must break with the past if they are to pursue the spiritual prize. God is interested in what believers do now and in the future. No one, declared Jesus, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. The clearest vision belongs to those who forget the past. And how true that is. Our churches are full of people that are paralyzed by what they did in their past. And they forget that they have been forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's possible that maybe somebody here tonight is feeling that way, or somebody watching online is feeling that way, that you're in bondage to your past. But you need to realize as part of your identity in Christ, who you are as a child of God means that Jesus has set you free from your past sins. He has set you free from the influence, from, from the, from the uh, impact they have in your life, from the guilt they can bring in your life. He has set you free from that. And you need to hear what the, the Apostle Paul says. Look again, forgetting those things which are behind. Too many Christians don't forget those things that are behind. Now, Paul does not identify those things that he says there. Um, I'm sure he could have listed so many things that we deal with in our past, but he kind of leaves it open for each of us to bring our own experience of what those things are. Because it's going to be different for you than it is for me. It's going to be different for this person and that person. But we have all these things in our past, and if we're not careful, we'll let them enslave us once again. So as we think about having freedom from our past as a child of God, there's three truths I want to share with you from this text tonight. The first one is this. Number one, don't let your past sins influence you. Don't let your past sins influence you. Past sins, past failures can be that ball and chain, you know? It's like you're you're dragging that thing around wherever you go. People, People live that way. Christians live that way. They're chained to the present by being chained to the past, and they can't move forward. The devil will do this a lot to us. The devil loves to throw our past up in our face. And he wants to depress us. He wants to discourage us. He wants to defeat us and get us out of, the, of living our life with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, think about those skeletons in our past. You know, here we are, another presidential election year. Oh, goody. You know, and, and there's all this mudslinging, all this skeletons coming out and everything like that and, and whatnot. We all have skeletons in our past because we're all sinners. But the sad reality is too many Christians are letting those skeletons torment their present and torment their future. They have influence over us because they forget who they are as a child of God. Some Christians are embarrassed. Some Christians are ashamed. Some Christians are haunted with feelings of guilt 
about this, something they did 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago. These past sins, these past failures are constantly having an impact on their life in the present. They're constantly bothering them. Back on August 24th, 1572, there was a massacre that took place to the Huguenots, and, and, and Charles the, the, the um, Ninth of France witnessed this. He saw all these Christians that were killed on this fateful night. And he said this to his physician. He says, I don't know what ails me. My whole frame seems to be in a fever. I see nothing around me but hideous faces covered with blood. You see, each night he would wake up to the screams of those Christians that were killed on that night. And over time, this affected him so much, he became bedridden and he became delirious because he was consumed about something that happened in the past. He was haunted by it. And like Charles IX of France, there are those Christians that are haunted by their past failures. There's those Christians that are haunted by their past sins. And maybe that, that, you know, they just have a hard time dealing with it. And they forget what the forgiveness of God does in their life. And, that, and so therefore they're shackled once again to their past sins. Our sins have a way of haunting us if we let them. The devil is a master of throwing the past up in our face. He loves to replay that video over our mind of us blowing it, of us making mistakes, of us giving it a temptation, and he accuses us. I mean, you think about it this way. On the front side of temptation, the devil makes it all attractive. Now, now don't get me wrong. I know it's not just the devil that, that tempts us. Our flesh tempts us. But the devil, when he tempts us, he makes that sin so attractive that we give into it. But on the back side, what's he do? He accuses us. Look how terrible you are. Look how rotten you are. Look how awful you are. And then throughout years, he'll try to throw that back in your face. And it's like you're replaying that video over in your mind. And he'll tell lies to us. You know, something like, you know, how can you serve God when you did that? You're such a wicked person. How, why would God ever want to use you? You call yourself a Christian, you can't even serve God because of what you've done in the past. And he'll throw these thoughts into our minds and sad reality is Christians believe them. And they become paralyzed in their walk with God. These are people that are sitting in churches who feel like they can never be used of God because of what they've done in the past. They hesitate to get involved because they feel that they're not worthy. Their past sin, their past failure not only haunts them, but also hinders them from enjoying the blessings of God. It hinders them from from finding the satisfaction and fulfillment of living out God's plan for their life. Notice what Paul says. He says, Brethren, I do not count myself to apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Look what Paul is saying here. He's saying, look, I haven't arrived. You know, we, we probably all know some Christian out there that says, you know, I've arrived. I, I, I don't sit anymore. I know everything I need to know. I don't need to read the Bible anymore. There's Christians out there that are that arrogant, you know. Well, they're lying to you because we don't arrive, you know. We won't be complete until we're with Jesus. And Paul says, look, I haven't arrived. I'm still growing. I'm still learning. You know, I have not apprehended it yet. I still struggle like you still struggle. But he wouldn't notice what he says. He says, I've forgotten those things in the past, though. Those struggles I had, I don't let them hinder me. I don't let them them haunt me. I don't let them have an influence on my present. You think, how could he say that? Well, if you're haunted and you're hindered by your past, let me just share something with you. Listen to what Adrian Rogers once said. He said, failures need not be final. And failures need not be fatal. I mean, think about it. If you failed God, you may have committed some terrible sin. And let me just say this, all sin is terrible, okay? We're the one who puts grades on it and stuff. But if you've done something in the past that you're deeply ashamed of, but hear me this, if you have confessed it and you have repented of it and you have asked forgiveness, you are forgiven by God. And that sin is to no longer have influence on you. Don't forget what God said through the psalmist in Psalms 103 verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I explained this the other week when we were talking about this very same concept. You start going around the globe, you start going east, you're never going to hit west. You start going west, you're never going to hit east. That's how far God has removed the sin from your life that you have confessed and repented of and that he has forgiven so you don't have to face it again. And yet we dredge it back up. Listen to what Micah chapter 7 verse 19 says. He will again have compassion on us. And will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all your, excuse me, you will cast all our sin into the depths of the sea. 
God has such compassion on us that when we confess our sin and we repent and he forgives us, it's like he casts our sin into the deepest ocean. Listen, some of y'all may have heard this from Corey Tim Boone. She wrote these words many years ago. She says this, she says, It was 1947. I had come from Holland to defeat a Germany with a message that God forgives. Now, if you know anything about Tori Kim Boone, she was in a concentration camp. And now here she is, she's coming back to Germany. And she goes on and she says this, It was the truth they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land, and I gave them my favorite mental picture. Maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind. I like to think that's where, where forgiven sins are thrown. When we confess our sins, I told them, God casts them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. Then God places a sign out there that says, no fishing allowed. That's what God does with our sins, friend. When it comes to your past sins and you've confessed them and you've repented of them and you're forgiven by God, put them behind you because God has dealt with them. Don't dredge them back up out of that ocean. God can bless and God can use you. God wants to bless and God wants to use you. But the enemy wants you to be influenced by your past. He wants you to be controlled by your past failures and and your past sins. Don't be influenced by the past, by your past failures, by your past sins that you have asked forgiveness for and he has forgiven. Do what Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting, you say it's hard to forget, ask the Holy Spirit to help you. And he will. He'll help you so you are influenced by these past things that you have already confessed and repented of and received forgiveness for. But here's the second truth I want you to see. Don't let your past hurts consume you. Don't let your past hurts consume you. You know, maybe someone is here or someone's watching online and, and you've been deeply hurt in the past. We probably all have been deeply hurt in the past at times, haven't we? But let's just be honest. I mean, people are just downright cruel. We live in a very cruel society. They can be downright evil, and there's no limits where some people will go or what some people will do. So if you're not careful, as people hurt us over the years, we can let those hurts in the past consume us in the present. It's like cancer eating us from the inside out. The Bible says this in Hebrews 12, 14 and 15. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Listen lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. If we don't do what Paul says and forget those things that are behind, those sins, those hurts, Paul says, you know what's going to happen? The root of bitterness is going to begin to grow in our life, and it's going to consume us. That's what the author of Hebrews says. You see, past hurts. Anybody ever been stung by a honeybee? I have, you know. Uh, you know, it's, it's, like a, it's like the stinger of a honeybee. You know, the sting, on the stinger of a honeybee, they have the barbs that are coming down the side. And when the, when the stinger goes in your flesh, those barbs stick into your flesh. And the bee flies away. But guess what? The stinger is still there, isn't it? You know? It still hurts until you get the stinger out. You know? And just like someone that has hurt us in the past, they've stung our hearts. If we don't remove the stinger, guess what? Our hearts are going to fill up with venom. It's going to fill up with bitterness and anger and hatefulness and rage. Maybe it was a family member, maybe it was a friend, maybe it was a a past church you were at, or a a church member, or somebody like that. If there's any bitterness or any hard feelings in our heart, we've got to remove it. We've got to ask God to help us remove it. Get along with God somewhere and just pour your heart out to God and say, God, I need you to remove these feelings I have, remove these negative feelings I have, so I'm not consumed by the hurts in my past. To hold on to feelings of anger and bitterness and even hurt, Think about this, is to allow that person that hurts you to rob you. They're continuing to rob you of your peace. They're continuing to rob you of your joy. They're continuing to rob you of your contentment. You're allowing that person to hurt you over and over and over again because you have that hurt you're hanging on to. Now, this is the hard part. We've got to cleanse our heart. How do we do that? We've got to forgive. We've got to forgive that person. Now, wait a minute, Dave. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know what... I, no, I don't. But I know what I've done to God. And he has forgiven me. But if you can't forgive them, you're not going to be able to clean your heart. Back on February 9th in 1960, Adolf Coors, you know, Coors beer, Adolf Coors III, he was kidnapped. He was held for ransom. Seven months later, his body was found on a remote hillside. He had been shot to death. 
His son, Adolf Kors IV, was 15 years old when this happened. He lost not only his father, but he lost his best friend. And for years, he hated the man that they caught that did this, Joseph Corbett. This is the man that, that killed his father. This is the man that was sentenced to life for murder. And then in 1975, 15 years later, the son became a Christian. He, got, he, he said, you know what? Y'all take the beer business and run with it. I'm out. But you know what he held on to? His bitterness. He let that bitterness begin to consume him, that hatred that he had for Joseph Corbett, that resentment that seethed inside of him, and it hindered his life. It hindered his growth in his new faith. So what did he do? He cried out to God for help because he realized how much he hated Joseph Corbett. And he was alienating himself from God. He was alienating himself from everybody. And so he cried out for God to help him. And then the day came. The son, with the power of the Holy Spirit, went to the prison where Joseph Corbett was. Visited the maximum security unit there at Colorado's Canyon City Penitentiary. He tried to talk with Joseph Corbett, but Corbett wouldn't see him. So what did the son do? He left him a Bible and he wrote this note inside. I'm here to see you today and I'm sorry that we could not meet. As a Christian, I am summoned by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to forgive. Now remember, he was 15 years old when Joseph Corbett killed his father. Kidnapped him and killed him. He was gone for seven months until they found the body. And he goes on to write this. I do forgive you. And I ask you to forgive me for the hatred I held in my heart for you. Later on, the son said this. He says, I have a love for that man that only Jesus could have put in my heart. I realize it's hard to forgive people. But God is the one who enables us to forgive. Do you need your heart clean from those feelings that are seething inside of you because what someone has done to you? If you have trouble forgiving, ask God to help you forgive, just like this son did. Don't let that hurt in the past consume you today in the present. I heard about this neighbor who had a farmer down the road, and he went down to see his farmer neighbor one time, and he was leaning on the fence while the farmer was out there plowing his field with a mule. And after a while, the neighbor spoke up as the farmer came by. He said, you know, I don't mean to butt in your business, but, you know, I think if you start using the words gee and ha to that mule instead of just tugging on those ropes, it'd be a whole lot easier. And the farmer said, well, I reckon so, you're right, but, you know, this animal kicked me five years ago, and I haven't talked to him since. That's how we are sometimes, isn't it? That's how people react in our society. Christians shouldn't react that way. But we want to react to that way to someone who's hurt us. But we must, not should, we must cleanse our hearts and forgive. But also, we must forget. Like Paul says, forget those things that are behind. We need to let it go. Not hold on to it, let it go. Lay our hurts, lay the reason that we're hurt at the foot of the cross and let God deal with that person. Take your hurts to the Lord. Leave them there. Don't let your past hurts put you back in bondage again. Don't let what others have robbed you, have done to rob you of the blessings of God. Cleanse your heart if you have these feelings. Clear your heart by forgiving and, and, and just giving it over to God and just leave it alone. Put your hurts behind you. You say, how is that possible? Because of who you are in Christ. That's how it's possible. Because God can enable us to do this. Now one more thing. Number three. We need to keep moving towards the goal. Don't just, not just deal with the past, but we've got a goal ahead of us. Look at verses 13 and 14 again. He goes on to say, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Instead of being shackled to our past, we need to continue to move forward towards the goal. You say, what's the goal? Christ-likeness. That's the goal that Paul is talking about here. Excuse me, to be like Christ. Remember what Paul says in Romans 8, 29? He says this, For whom, talking about God, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined. So God, he knew before time, we we're going to trust Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. He predestined us to what? To be conformed to the image of his Son. God's desire for every single one of us is to be Christ-like. To be Christ-like. That's the goal. The problem we have sometimes is we let our past consume us and paralyze us from reaching forward and striving for that goal. 
That phrase there, reaching forward, that Paul uses describes the stretching of a muscle to its limit. It's the picture of a runner straining with every muscle to reach that finish line. It takes great effort to keep moving towards the goal. It's not easy, let's just be honest, it's not, to be Christ-like and to keep on seeking to grow in Christ-likeness. See, Satan wants us to give up. He wants us to stop reaching forward towards the goal. He wants us to be controlled and influenced and consumed by our past sins, by our past hurts. And when we feel this way, we want to give up, don't we? We want to start, we'll stop striving for, to be Christ-like. We want to put ourselves out of the game, if you will. And that's what Satan wants. But that's not what God wants for us. God wants us to be conformed to the image of his son. So we need to remember that as a child of God, our past has no power over us because of what Jesus has done for us. Jesus died to forgive us and to break the bondage of sin in our lives. And we need to stop putting the shackles back on. We need to stop putting our back, our, ourselves back into enslavement to our past. Remember, Jesus purchased your freedom. And when you confess your sin and repent of it, he forgave you. The bondage was broken. As a child of God, you have freedom from your past. Never forget that. We need to remind ourselves about that every so often, don't we? Every time you're tempted to let the past influence you, when you start hearing the, those thoughts in your mind, whether it's your flesh telling you this, or whether Satan's putting a thought in your mind that you're worthless, that you're useless, that God doesn't want to use you, remember what the Word of God says. You matter to Him. Jesus died for you to give you victory over your past sins, your past hurt. doesn't matter what you've done. God still wants to use you. God still loves you. So looking at your life tonight, are you enslaved to your past? Have you put the shackles back on? You don't have to be. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to forget what is behind and to reach towards the goal. Father, we are grateful for what you have done in our lives and continue to do. But sometimes we forget. We forget the freedom you have brought into our lives and we put the shackles back on. Father, forgive us for that. Help us to remember, Jesus, what you have done for us when you purchased us with your shed blood on the cross of Calvary. When we confess our sins, repent of them, you forgave us, Lord. And we are grateful and thankful, but sometimes we forget that that applies to the past as well. And we let that past sin creep into our mind like a video playing over and over again. And all of a sudden we start believing the lies of the enemy that we're worthless, that we're useless, that you don't love us. And, and we become paralyzed in our faith. And that's right where Satan wants us. But it's not where you want us. So remind us what you have done for us. Remind us through your spirit, remind us through your word that our past is in the past. Help us to forget so it doesn't have influence over us. So it doesn't consume us. But Lord, we need your help to continue to strive forward towards the goal of being Christ-like. So please help us, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.